the Western world, the inheritance we have, whether we see it as part of the Anglosphere, whether we see it as part of Western civilization, that's an inheritance that has been so valuable to the world. It puzzles me that we sometimes soft pedal it. We're, we're, we're stuttering in our articulation of it. And that is something that does trouble me. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's a really a great privilege for me to, uh, to welcome the Honorable John Howard, uh, Prime Minister of Australia from 1996 to uh, 2007, and the longtime leader of the Liberal Party in Australia. As you know, the Australian Liberal Party is really the Conservative Party. <laughs> Things in, they're upside down and left to right in Australia. That's the, <laughs> from the Canadian perspective. But uh, John is a lawyer by training and resides in Sydney. Uh, his career, and many of you have seen his, uh, his bio uh, on our website, uh, has included many uh, leadership contests, many election battles, and uh, many public policy achievements, uh, all of which can be instructive to Canadian Conservatives. Uh, John and Stephen Harper uh, mutually supported each other when their terms uh, uh, overlapped on, on a number of important issues. I think they saw eye to eye on the importance of fiscal responsibility in governments uh, on defence, defence not just of our own countries but of the free world, and. Uh, on foreign policy issues, and uh, I believe uh, Mr. Howard and Stephen have had a chance to renew their friendship on, the, on this visit. Uh, in a recent uh, Galaxy poll, and of course we all like the polls, particularly when they say the right thing, uh, in a recent <laughs> Galaxy poll, he was voted Australia's best prime minister and polled uh, a poll which gave him about 30% ahead of the current Labour prime minister in Australia. <laughs> I suggested to him that he might want to get back into the arena with those kind of numbers. But, uh, so uh, John and Mrs. Howard have come a long, long way to be with us and we're just absolutely delighted that they uh, have chosen to do so. So please uh, welcome, give a good Canadian welcome to the Honourable John Winston Howard. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Preston, for that very generous welcome. Uh, you may think we have these pieces of nomenclature upside down with the use of the word liberal in a slightly different context. It's not quite as bad as the use of colours, though, in the United States, where... Uh, <laughs> That dreaded socialist red is embraced by the Republicans and uh, blue is embraced by the Democrats. Uh, but before I start with what I wanted to say about uh, conservatism in Australia and whatever, can I bring you some good news from Australia? And <clears throat> that is, um, overnight Canadian time, uh, there was an election in Western Australia, which is broadly defined as the Alberta of Australia. Uh, uh, you know, sometimes when you fly over Western Australia, you don't see many people, although you can see lots of iron ore, and that's uh, uh, very, very valuable uh, to all Australians. But there was a huge victory in that state election uh, for our side of politics, and in a lower house of... You know, um, <clears throat> in a lower house of about 60... Um, it looks as if the uh, coalition of the Liberal Party and the National Party will have 40 seats with the Labor Party reduced to 19. And the really, really good news is that the Greens have been decimated. And that, uh, uh, and that is absolutely... I mean, there is something worse than the Labor Party in Australia, and that's the Greens. I can, I can assure you of that. If I had to choose between the Labor Party and the Greens, I'd choose the Labor Party every time because they do contain a lot of decent men and women who uh, have a different view as to what is a good Australia, but they have a very genuine commitment to the future of their country. Can I just start by saying that although 
you may find um, my experiences and reflections of some value in assessing the state of conservatism around the world. And I start by saying that you have no reason to be concerned about the state of conservatism in this country. Uh, I can't find a better conservative leader anywhere in the world than Stephen Harper. I really can't. <laughs> mm. Mm. His achievement in the last election, uh, and all the more so because he, he took strong out there upfront positions on a lot of controversial issues, his achievement the last election was, was quite remarkable. Now, in looking at any um, assessment of the relevance of Australia experience to Canada, because you've got to understand a couple of things. Uh, we do have a different electoral system. Unlike most of the Western world and certainly all of the Anglosphere, um, we have compulsory voting and it's compulsory preferential voting. So in a single member riding, as you call them, um, you've, if you've got three candidates, you've got to put one, two, three. And uh, if, if one of them doesn't get an absolute majority of ones, you've got to distribute the second preference uh, from the others. And it's compulsory you number the three squares. Uh, and uh, it's a very significant difference. And we've had that for years, and there's no likelihood of it being changed. People may have philosophical reservations about it, but I can assure you neither party organisation uh, is, has any interest in changing it because uh, it obviously uh, renders the uh, campaigning challenge uh, very different. I mean, I hear, heard this morning <clears throat> at your conference about uh, the application of data to to getting people out to vote, and well, that doesn't exist. The other thing is that we have a, uh, a fully elected Senate. Our Senate is elected on the basis of... <laughs> oh. <clears throat> mm -hmm. yeah. I'm not <laughs> going to run for your Senate, but... Um, <laughs> uh, um, elected on the basis of, of, of 12 from each state. And, uh, I mean, it was the Federation deal. The smaller state said, we'll come into the Federation, but so it's not dominated by Sydney and Melbourne. Uh, the, uh, the, the smaller state said, we want the same number of senators. And it's, a it's elected on proportional representation. And the only thing the Senate can't do uh, is really initiate a money bill. But the Senate otherwise has coextensive powers with the House of Representatives. And as was demonstrated in the famous time in 1975 when supply was blocked, um, the, the Senate uh, can exercise that coextensive power in quite a dramatic fashion. The Liberal Party of Australia is the custodian of the conservative tradition in Australian politics as well as classical liberalism. And the name Liberal Party was chosen by uh, the founder of the party, Robert Menzies, the longest serving Prime Minister in Australian history an outstanding figure who governed uh, as Prime Minister for an unbroken period of 16 years between 1949 and early 1966. He was, cho it was chosen uh, having in mind the classic uh, definition of liberalism, of English liberalism. Uh, I often say that my party, the Liberal Party, is the party of Edmund Burke and John Stuart Mill. Uh, and if you are somebody who believes in individual liberty, as well as somebody who believes in uh, preserving what is valuable from our past, then the Liberal Party of Australia uh, is the party for you. Uh, I call it frequently a broad church. Um, any political party to be successful in the modern world has got to be a broad church. Uh, I always encourage my members... Uh, not to try and say who is the true Liberal. You get these debates, you get people saying, well, look, you know, the real Liberal Party is the party that has this attitude on this issue. Um, that's a very bad practice. I, I'm sure that you have occasionally um, encountered that sort of phenomenon uh, within the Conservative Party in Canada. All political parties these days are coalitions. Uh, and... One of the things that is characteristic of Australian politics, and I'm sure it's characteristic of Canadian politics, indeed the politics all around the free world, 
uh, is that it is now less tribal than it used to be. When I was growing up uh, and getting involved in politics, uh, there was what I called a 40-40-20 rule, that 40% always voted for the Labor Party, 40% always voted for us, and there were 20% in the middle. Uh, when I look at some of the fluctuations now, I think it's now a 30-30-40 rule, where, and, and, and that old saying that, oh, so-and-so is going to vote Liberal for the first time in his life, his father will be turning in his grave at the very thought. Well, I mean, that still happens, uh, but it happens to a far less um, significant degree. In the 68 years that have gone by since the end of World War II, uh, the Liberal Party and the National Party have governed in coalition in Australia for, at a federal level for 42 of those 68 years. And the other thing to point out, of course, is that we have a formal coalition with the National Party. Its name used to be the Country Party, which suggests that it, what it is, and that is it's an exclusively rural-based or provincial-based party, and uh, the coalition has always been harmonious. You have a few arguments. We had one very disruptive period when um, the Queensland government, which was governed by a country party man of, you know, of, uh, uh, quite uh, interesting attitudes on a lot of issues, uh, thought that he was going to become Prime Minister and that broke the coalition for a while. That's when we were in opposition. But overall, coalitions worked very well. And on major economic issues, to their enormous credit, the leadership of the National Party has been you know, very supportive of sensible economic policies. When I was Prime Minister, I said in talking about my own, attitude, my own attitudes and my own um, party. I said that I was an economic liberal and a social conservative. Um, now, those terms uh, can mean different things to different people. An economic liberal, in my view, is somebody who does believe very strongly in free markets, who believes that government should occupy less of the space than it does at the present time, that um, the right of people to um, start a business and uh, make a decent profit uh, and uh, pass on the benefits of that to their family is something that everybody in our society should aspire to. Uh, an economic liberal is somebody who believes in free trade. An economic liberal is somebody who believes that if somebody wants to uh, directly negotiate with their employer um, without the compulsory intervention of a trade union, then that person has a right to do that, uh, provided, <laughs> provided there are not, um, you know, there are minimum uh, standards observed, but beyond that they should be able to do it. Uh, an economic liberal is somebody who believes that uh, taxation should be as low as possible, consistent uh, with the, the need of government to have revenue for things that are essential in the national good, uh, such as defence, basic levels of health services, police, law and order, and all of those things that are traditionally uh, the role of governments in civilised societies. Uh, like all prime ministers and all governments, um, when we were in power, we had to strike a balance between ideological zeal, if I can put it that way, and, um, and realism. I had an injunction that I frequently delivered to my cabinet, and that is that it's better to be 80% pure in government than 125% pure in opposition. Uh, and uh, the, the message of that is obvious, that you have got to strike a balance between those two. But if the purity falls below 80%, um, you, you are going to start finding that people lose faith in you. The greatest challenge that uh, our side of politics has, indeed it's a challenge that both sides of politics have uh, in the modern world, at a time when political parties are no longer mass movements and where on occasions the differences between the two sides of politics is particularly on economic issues, are not as great as they might have been on past occasions. 
is to constantly re-articulate to the electorate what you believe in and what you stand for. There were many things said about me as Prime Minister, as there always is about Prime Ministers. Some of them were complimentary, uh, many of them were not, but that is the nature of the game. But the expression that I liked most being used about me, and it was on occasions, was when people would say, well, love him or loathe him, and there were usually a few more of the latter than the former, at least we know what John Howard stands for. And it's tremendously important, simple though it is to say this, tremendously important to keep reminding people uh, of what you stand for. Uh, I had a very trusted advisor, and he remains a close friend, who used to say to me, after we'd made a cabinet decision, I was about to go out uh, and announce it. Uh, he would say to me, boss, what's the why? Uh, and that was his shorthand way of saying, the first thing you've got to tell people is why you're doing it. That's even more, in other words, you've got to explain the malady that this decision is addressing, even before you explain what you're going to do, because unless people are convinced that there's a problem that needs to be fixed, they'll be suspicious. Uh, that you're just needlessly interfering uh, in their lives by this decision. So it is very, very important to do that always. It's very important for our side of politics to cultivate what I loosely call the conservative blue collar vote. Uh, no political party has a natural base that extends to 51%. You have a base, I mean, our, so we, small business, families, uh, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, you, you, have a, you have a natural base that goes up and down. But you've always got to cultivate um, uh, people who historically may have been inclined to vote for the other side because of, they see themselves as working class, they see themselves as traditionally being unionist. They call them in Australia Howard Battlers, they call them in the United States Reagan Democrats. Um, uh, Margaret Thatcher was very good at cultivating the trade union vote. It was extraordinary, despite the cumulative rows that she had with the trade union movement and the way in which she systematically dismantled the power of the trade union movement, she was still able to grab a large chunk of their vote because she understood uh, what was necessary to appeal to that section of the community. And people who believe uh, in, in, in a fair go, as we call it in Australia, they're people who believe in a decent living standard and the aspiration of their children doing better than they have done. And they're also people who believe in their nation. They're great patriots. Uh, the conservative side of politics should always be the party of Canadian or Australian or whatever it is, nationalism. Uh, you never surrender uh, the, the tag of, of, of nationalism uh, to your political opponent. Of course, political parties should sink their differences when the true national interest is at stake and, and never pretend that, 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 that you know, because you're a liberal, you're a better Australian than somebody who's not liberal. But in the way you address issues, just remember that people at heart are deep nationalists. We still live in a world of nation states. Uh, we haven't surrendered our national identity to multilateralism. Uh, and, I mean, this, of course, is a live... <laughs> and we're seeing people in Europe kicking against this, and, but others may have something to say uh, about this, uh, uh, about this uh, a little later on, <laughs> and I, I'll, I'll stand aside for that. But um, I think it's very, very important. Now, two or three other things I want to touch on, and then I'll finish with a message about the next federal election in Australia. Um, I think it's very, very important for the conservative side of politics to never lose cultural self-belief, either in your political philosophy uh, or indeed in the society in which we live. One of the depressing things about Western commentary over the past few decades is the way in which we have really spent an enormous amount of time downplaying our achievements, of soft-pedalling the values of Western civilization. 
of being in a state of, you know, almost stuttering apology for what the West has achieved, stuttering apology for what the free market has achieved. I mean, the greatest thing that's happened in the last 30 years is that hundreds of millions of people have been lifted out of poverty by the operation of globalisation and competitive capitalism. <laughs> mm. We have a big focus on China in Australia because China buys a lot of we have and we're very grateful for that. Uh, and but the, the real story about China is the hundreds of millions of people in that country who are now middle class. And, and that's terrific. And it wouldn't have happened if Deng Xiaoping hadn't said in 1978 that we're going to change our economic approach and, and embrace uh, one that's based more on markets. Now, I don't think um, China is a perfectly functioning market economy, don't get me wrong, it's not. Uh, and it'll be a long time before it is, but it's better than what it was and we shouldn't lose sight of it. But more importantly, um, the Western world, the inheritance we have, whether we see it as part of the Anglosphere, whether we see it as part of Western civilization generally, parliamentary democracy, the defence of parliamentary democracy in which, and, and, and democracy generally in which Canadians and Australians have stood together from the very beginning when it's been under threat. Um, that's an inheritance that has been so valuable to the world, it puzzles me that we sometimes soft pedal it. We, we're, we're, we're stuttering in our articulation of it. And that is something that does trouble me. The, first, the last thing I want to say is that in Australia at the moment, things do look good for the return of a coalition government under Tony Abbott as Prime Minister. As I'm sure you know, the last election in Australia produced a dead heat. Um, and the, the, the government has remained in office for now over two years with the support of some independents, two in particular who were elected in conservative seats, but they nonetheless decided to support, for a combination of reasons, uh, the Labor Party. And it was a great achievement of Tony Abbott uh, to come so close to winning because since Federation in 1901, there's only been one government in the history of Australia that's been booted out after its first term. And that was the Scullin Labor government in the depths of the Great Depression in the early 1930s. And Tony Abbott was so close to being the second to achieve that outcome. And, and given the different circumstances and given uh, what had happened, uh, it was quite amazing that he went so close and he deserves an enormous amount of credit. And he's been very disciplined, he's been very effective, he's had simple messages, he confronted the Labor Party on the issue of climate change and uh, Kevin Rudd, who you remember, was removed by his own party uh, before he'd completed his first term and quite astonishing thing for a political party to do. I think it still puzzles the electorate. Never uh, in a parliamentary system, and we both have it, never lose sight of the fact that although we have a parliamentary system, there is a presidential attitude that people have towards their government. It's the Harper government or the Howard government or the Cretian government or whatever may be the case. And the attitude in Australia when Rudd was removed from a lot of people was, well, hang on. Um, we elected him, we didn't elect her, a reference to Julia Gillard, our current Prime Minister, who replaced her. Now that placed him. It's all right to do that if somebody's been Prime Minister for a very long time and the public has been prepared for it. But after you've elected somebody for the first time and he hasn't even completed his first term, it's a pretty silly thing to have done, which of course is a commentary on the difficulty the Labor Party has at the present time. If ever there's a party in the Western world at the moment that is suffering from a problem of people not knowing what it stands for. Uh, it's the current government in Australia. And that's not just a partisan comment. I think most observers of Australian politics would accept that that is a reasonable proposition. So can I uh, say to your friends, and I'll, I'll finish on this note, that it's, it's a huge 
um, privilege to address this gathering. I'm uh, aware of the tremendous work that Preston Manning and this institute has done. I think these organisations are very important uh, to keeping the feet of conservative politicians to the fire, if I can put it that way, uh, when it comes to um, uh, the maintenance of strong values and strong attitudes. But the most important thing always in politics is to stand for something. And once a government looks as though it doesn't stand for something and it's lost its way philosophically, it's only a matter of time before the public voted out. I think that's the great strength that Stephen Harper has. People know where he stands. They may not always agree with it, I mean, but, I mean, for example, the stand he's taken in relation to that absurd United Nations partial rec uh, recognition of the Palestinian state was absolutely correct. <laughs> it, it, was, it was almost alone. I took a similar stand when I was Prime Minister and, uh, on, a, on a similar issue affecting Israel and and Palestine, and we were equally alone, along with uh, the United States and Israel and a few other countries, but it, it was a stand of principle, and people respect that, even though they may not agree with it, but I say, well, at least he's got the courage of his convictions, and that is hugely important. In the end, it's the only thing that delivers you respect politically, to take stands and to stick to them through thick and thin, and that's a quality that true conservatives, whether you call them in Australia liberals or whether you call them by their name conservative uh, here in Canada or in the United Kingdom, uh, that is the attitude and the pose and the behaviour of true conservatives. Thank you.